you see blessing Joanne and Stephanie on here. I shared it with them and we picked out topics which are spoken about but not always touched on, especially in the Christendom. So it was just really for us to come together, have these workshops to be able to encourage each other, a place where there's safety, a place where there's no judgment, but different topics that we can all relate to. And we delve deeper into your childhood, we delve deeper into adulthood, we delve deeper into healing, we delve deeper into different topics. Because what I found is that through experience and through people coming to EW, a lot of people feel judged. They feel as though because you're a Christian, you don't have issues, you don't go through hardships, you don't lose friends, you don't go through heartbreak. So we wanted this to be a platform where we come together and we really just delve deeper into these areas and so when we pick the speakers for this we don't just pick anyhow we pick with intentionality knowing that they have an understanding of this area and that they can come and speak with us as well as share testimonies as well so that in a nutshell is what it is and through EUW there's events there's resources one-to-one -one counseling and different things of that nature and as I said before today's topic is really a part two of the part one of last month which is, um, I think last month was childhood trauma. And this one is abuse in relationships, which can all tie together with the umbrella of trauma, umbrella of abuse. And, you know, sometimes we go through things and we can't put language to what we go through. So I really hope that this will give you language to what it is that we're going to discuss. And yeah, apart from that, I'm going to continue just a bit about um, what abuse actually is for me. And something that God laid on my heart today was to remind us all because it's, it's kind of a common thing that abuse sometimes we look at it and we think oh abuse is just the physical but you know when we look at abuse there's verbal abuse there's spiritual abuse there's the physical there's emotional there's different types of abuse but sometimes we liken abuse to just the physical and he really wanted me to stress on the fact that when you do come to these workshops I know the word trigger is thrown about quite a lot but if you do feel as though you are being triggered or you feel as though it's bringing something up from the past or you feel as though there are some things that you still are currently in that you thought you were okay with but you're not, please seek professional support. Now, I would say come to me to counsel you, but because of the relationship that we have in EUW, I may not be able to counsel you in cherished voices, but we could do prayers in EUW, but I can refer you to people such as Pamela who can support you and other counselling services, just so that you don't come carry all of this and then leave with it and ask yourself, what am I supposed to do with this? Um, again, there's prayer support, there's counselling support, just don't come on, listen to stuff, know there's something going on internally and ignore it. So um, another thing as well he wanted me to touch on is that of community. Community is very important. You know, I know that when we asked that question, a lot of you were able to say that you have a strong community around you. And even for those of you who don't have that strong community, it's my prayer that God will bring the right people around you, whether in your actual church or through another church, whichever way it will look like for you, just so that you have that support. Because sometimes when we go through things, or majority of the times when we go through things, it's very easy to want to isolate ourselves and act like we can handle it ourselves. And I've been victim of that. And I know people who have as well. But if you have a sister or you have a brother in Christ that you can speak to, it's very, very um, beneficial to you because you can pray together. God can speak through them to minister to you. It's just a burden that you have that has been halved. So, um, yeah, that's it. Our first speaker is sad to actually not here. So I don't know if we should give it to Pamela and then she might come on after. Pamela, I don't know if you are free and if you like to go. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and I can see you. That's good. There's always technical difficulties when trying to set these things up. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad. It's... Let me see. Okay, what I'm going to do is I will introduce you. That's if you're okay to go. Yeah, first. yeah. yeah that's fine. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Pamela. It's Pamela Simwanza is a social worker and founder of The Vision. I'm going to put her details in the chat, by the way. And in the chat as well, there is a form. So if you see it, please fill it in. During the workshop, feel free to fill it in. It just helps us with feedback. It helps us with making sure that we make these as effective as possible. <laughs> Oh, yeah. 
Why do you guys keep ducking behind the bed? You keep pointing those guns at us. Oh my god, do not worry about it. It's like, oh, yeah. Abuse, bereavement, family relationship dysfunction and domestic violence through free advice, one-to-one emotional mentoring and tra- training. Pamela is also a wife and first time mom to a baby boy. She enjoys spending time with her family and values the time spent together. Pamela is focused and dedicated to bringing about healing and restoration to women in this generation. Want to get in touch with her for some support? As mentioned above, she can be reached on info at the vision.co.uk or www.thevision-vision.co.uk and then at the underscore V-I-S-N on Instagram. Again, that's a mouthful, but I'll put it all in the chat so you are aware of how to connect with her. So Pamela, first of all, I want to say thank you and God bless you. We've got you here for part two. God bless (laughs) you. Um, Yeah, so it's over to you to have the floor and share with us. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I hope you're okay. Thank you so much Lisa for that introduction as well. Um, and thank you for having me again. It's always a pleasure being here and being able to share and being part of you know, your network and what you're doing, which is amazing. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. So hi guys, I hope you're okay. Um, so today we're going to be talking about a very important um, and sensitive topic. Um, however, I want to create a very safe space, a space where people can share, a place where people can engage with me, um, simply because of how sensitive it is. And, you know, like Lisa mentioned as well, if at any point, if you do like some support, you can make contact with myself or you can make contact with her and we'll be able to support you moving forward. Um, I do want to make this very interactive. So at some point I'm going to be asking questions. So please feel free to unmute your microphones and, you know, feel free to put some things in the chat as well. You know, normally when I do this course, I'm quite formal. So I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to switch up a little bit today and try and make it as informal as I can. Um, so like Lisa rightly mentioned, we're talking today about abuse in relationships. And that in itself is very, very, very broad. You know, abuse really can be defined as any act. Um, I'll probably say any act that intentionally hurts or harms somebody. Now when it comes to relationships, there are so many different types of relationships. You know, you've got platonic relationships. This is your friendship. Some people refer to them as associates or acquaintances when they're not that close. You know, you've got your family relationship. Of course, this is your siblings, your parents, your cousin. You've got obviously intimate relationships as well. So this is the couples, you know, the boyfriend, girlfriend, the marriage. And of course, you've got things like your professional relationships. So this is things to do with like your work colleagues or the type of relationship you may have with your lecturer or, you know, your teacher at school or college or, or uni. So abuse in itself can happen throughout any of these relationships. Abuse is not subject to one type of relationship. It's not subject to your age, your race, your background, where you're from. Abuse can happen to anybody and it can happen in any relationship. Um, but I think that type that I want to focus on today is domestic abuse or domestic violence Um, and the reason being is that it really I'll probably say domestic abuse is more of an umbrella term for all the different types of abuses that can happen Um, and often at times when we talk about domestic violence or domestic abuse the word domestic simply means family affairs like I said things like the family unit the intimate relationships Um, And the term domestic abuse can really be defined as any form of sort of patterns of behaviors that is done to basically gain control and power over somebody else. Now, when it comes to, like I said, the different types of abuses, there is so many different types. But the reason why I wanted to focus on domestic abuse today is because I believe that although it's reported quite a bit, you know, if you look at statistics, there are so many different people reporting the abuses that they face. It doesn't really reflect how much it is actually going on. I don't believe that the numbers that we see is actually what it is. There is so much more. But the reason why a lot of people don't report it is because, again, it's, it's in the word domestic. It's to do with family affairs. It's to do with intimate relationships. And we all sometimes feel obligated to protect the people that we're close with the people that we trust, our family units, our parents, our siblings, you know, our partners, there is is almost an unspoken sense of obligation to protect them because they've loved you or because maybe they helped you when you needed them and they've been out, you know, they've been with you throughout your life. So as a result of this as well, a lot of 
the times people don't go report it or even when they know it's abuse they almost they're in denial because abuse isn't particularly a, a nice thing that anybody wants to go through so to then be abused by somebody of trust somebody that you know somebody that you grew up with somebody in your household somebody that you share a meal with you know it's almost it's a very sticky thing so a lot of people are in denial as when they don't like to talk about it so before I go any further onto my first type of engagement and with you guys today. So like I said, feel free to unmute yourself. Feel free to put things in the chat as well. Can anybody tell me the different types of abuse that you may get under the umbrella of domestic abuse? So yeah, feel free to unmute your mics or put it in the chat and then I'm gonna look at them and then I'm gonna add someone if need be and then we're gonna carry on. Financial. Financial. Oh yes. Can you, yeah, yeah, definitely. That is a huge one under when it comes to domestic abuse, and we're going to touch on that a bit later on. Um, anyone else? Gaslighting. Yes, that's a really good one as well. Definitely happens a lot in domestic abuse relationships. Coercion and control. Yeah, definitely. You guys are literally you're saying everything I had listed down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anything else? Um, emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You've got emotional. And somebody else was trying to say something. I think sometimes it also can be um, sexual. Sometimes in those yeah. relationships, sexual yeah. violation can occur. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Everything that you guys have mentioned is all right. You know, coercive control, you know, they've actually created a law in itself around it because of how subtle it is. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things whereby you can't, it's not like physical abuse whereby it leaves bruises or, you know, physical violence or the choking and the stabbing and the pushing and the shoving. Mm. Things like that, it doesn't leave bruises. It's very subtle. It's those little things like, oh, you know, you sure you want to wear that? You know, I don't really think your legs are legs not good as that anymore. Before you know it, your favorite dress, you're not wearing it anymore. <laughs> you know, it's just those little subtle comments that seems okay. But actually, if you analyze it and if you look at it over a period of time where it, it happens consistently, it chips away to the self-esteem, self-confidence. You know, it's little things like, oh, you know, where are you going? Take a picture. I need to know where you are. Show me where you are. Send me. There is a great film known as um, Murdered by My Boyfriend. I think it's a brilliant film. And it really shows you how these little subtle things actually lead, you know, to, to really ruin in a person's life. So, yeah, if anybody does um, watch it, yeah well do watch it if you'd like to but it's a, it's a really really good film about domestic abuse in an intimate relationship so you know there's things like manipulation which again is very very subtle you know things like using your words against you somebody said gaslighting this is where you basically begin to question your sanity so you know something has happened you know it's happened they know it's happened but the way they portray it makes you seem like actually maybe it didn't happen in that way well am i overthinking it i'm exaggerating it you know, sexual abuse definitely falls under that as well. Emotional abuse, psychological, you know, with domestic abuse, like I said, often at times you don't just find one type of abuse happening in it. It's often a combination of all these things. Likely there is physical going on, likely there is sexual, likely there is manipulation, coercive control, likely there's financial. Financial abuse is one of the main ones when it comes to a lot of domestic abuse uh, cases. And I'll explain that a bit later on as well. So yeah, thank you so much guys for engaging with me. So my next, um, I suppose, multiple question to you is that I'm going to be reading out some statistics and let me know what you think. So number one, on an average hour, how many times does the police receive a call about domestic abuse? A, 17, B, 37, or 3, 100? What do you guys think? One hundred. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. One hundred in an hour, in the space of just one hour. By the time you close your eyes, you take it up, it's finished. <laughs> that that hour is gone. In the space of an hour, the police get a hundred calls of, of people reporting domestic abuse or violence, whether it's in an intimate relationship or whether it's in the home. So that is a very, very high number. And you know, these things tend to go up. When it comes to things like football seasons or Christmases and birthdays, and I'll explain the reason why a bit later on as well. So statistic, statistic number two, how many women are killed in a month due to domestic abuse? Number one is two. 
Number two is eight and number three is seven. What do you guys think? In a month, how many women are killed as a result of domestic abuse or domestic violence, whether it be oh. abused by the partner or whatever it, the case may be? Seven? Nice. The answer is actually B, is eight. Eight. Oh, so I thought, I, I thought it was lower than that, so I didn't hear it properly there. Yeah, mm. so the answer is eight. Eight women. Imagine in a month. Mm. eight women are killed okay, that's, that's, that's a lot that's quite a high number mm. um, number three in the year of March 2019 how many women experienced domestic abuse we've got A 250,000 B 1.2 million or C 1.6 million and this is just experience of it how many women would you say experienced it? Hmm. So we've got 250,000, 1.2 million or 1.6 million. Okay, someone's put in the chat B. The B is 1.2 million. The actual answer is C, 1.6 mm. million. So again, this is March alone. <laughs> These wow. numbers are very, very high. And like I said, when it comes to certain special occasions as well, they creep up much more the average number um number four how many children have been exposed to domestic abuse number or well, a one in five b one in ten or c one in three this is children being exposed to abuse within their home environment so whether it's between mom and dad so somebody said c the actual answer is a one in five children so imagine that just just try and imagine that for a minute Maybe you go on a playground, right? And look, or even a park, this lovely weather, go to a park and see so many children playing. One in five of them have been exposed to this type of behavior, this patterns of, of behavior, whether it's in their home or, you know, at their auntie's house, at their uncle's house, wherever the case may be, they've actually experienced, um, they've been exposed to this. And, you know, the sad thing is that a lot of children as well as being exposed to it, I actually also sometimes attack in the process. They're also abused as well. Um, so it's, it's not even just the exposure. Obviously, the exposure in itself has so many different, you know, long-term long impacts. So imagine actually being in, being in that chaos when it's happening and experiencing some of it as well. And it's quite scary for, for any child, you know, especially looking up to people who are meant to protect you guide you and, and and help you navigate life and if this is where your foundation starts you know how much more you know is, is it going to be for you later on in the future and number five this is the final one perpetrators are always men so a is yes and b is no what do you guys think yeah that's right that's really good everybody's put in b which is really good so yeah, like I said, you know, when it comes to domestic abuse, it's, there are high numbers, but these are only the reported cases. There is a lot of cases that go unreported. You know, like I mentioned earlier as well, when it comes to things like football season, the cases of DV went up, even COVID in itself. COVID brought about so many different cases when it comes to things like Christmases, New Year parties, you know, anywhere where there's often alcohol involved, when people drink, they start to lose sense of the awareness around them. Christmas parties, that's when secrets start coming out. That's when Auntie Flora doesn't like Uncle Pia. <laughs> you know, it starts an argument. And before you know it, bottles are being thrown, kids are being hit. So every time there's celebrations are at like mostly Christmas, around Christmas time and football seasons, cases always shoot up. Even in COVID alone, you know, there's been such a high level of cases, so much so that a lot of domestic abuse charities had to come together to create like a, a, a safety word for any person who may be going through it. And, and that safety word is Annie. And the idea is that you can go to any pharmacy shop and if you say, I need to speak to Annie, the pharmacist will know that that's a code to say, I need immediate action, I need help. So they'll take you to the back and obviously call the police as well. So this is literally, they've had to create this since we've been in COVID due to how high the numbers have been. So this is a really, really serious topic. And, you know, like I said, football season, people are drinking alcohol with the team loses. 
you know, some women are being beaten, <laughs> some men are being hit, some children are being attacked as a result of the perpetrators not knowing how to manage their emotions or their anger around however they're feeling, whatever they're feeling. So it, it's quite a difficult thing. And I know even with the statistics that I mentioned earlier, I talked a lot about women, but domestic abuse is not just about women. I know, again, if you watch the news or if you see adverts, often at times what you see is a woman being portrayed with bruises and, you know, the man being a perpetrator. But actually a lot of men are abused as well. And a lot of parents are abused by their teenage children as well, their adolescent children. But these are some of the things that go unreported. Why? One, because of the shame and guilt around it. For example, how society view men, the idea is that they're very masculine. So imagine a man coming out to say, my wife or my partner or my girlfriend is, is hitting me, is abusing me, is sexually harassing me, is raping me. These things are very foreign to a lot of us. So as a result of that, a lot of cases, a lot of men who are being abused don't even go and report it. Mothers who are being attacked by their teenage children who don't know how to manage their anger, their, their daughters, their sons, their fathers being hit and beaten by their, their kids. They can't come out because, again, societal's idea of parenting is that you're meant to be the leader of the home. You're meant to guide your children. You're meant to protect them. So how can you ask for protection from your child? Do you see what I mean? So when it comes to domestic abuse, there is so many different things. Like I said, this is not exempt to somebody's race, their age, <laughs> their ethnic backgrounds. Um, you know, when it comes to a lot of BME communities, black and minority ethnic communities as well, there is so many different barriers that stops people from reporting these abuses. One being language barrier. If you can't even speak English, how can you pick up the phone and call for help? Those people can't, they're suffering. You know, two, a lot of them immigration, if you don't have your papers, there's threats when it comes to DV. If you go here, they're gonna deport you. They're gonna take your kids away. So a lot of people are suffering in silence as well. Again, the shame in the community because we don't talk about it, because we're not open about these things. You know, you, you hear so many different things and, you know, it's all hidden within the family. But there are so many barriers, again, that stops a lot of BME people from reporting it. I mean, I'll share one of my cases that I had with you um, when I was practicing in child protection. So there was a lady, she was an Asian lady. Um, she, um, obviously within that community, they marry it within their family. So she was married to a cousin and they lived in a house with, the, with her husband's mom as well. Cause again, they like to live within large family units. He was very, very abusive, extremely abusive. She didn't have work. So initially when she came here, it seemed very rosy and very nice. The idea is that you be a stay at home mom, I'll work, I'll bring the money. Again, that's an element of control because when she wanted to run away, she didn't have money. <laughs> she didn't have access to an account. These are some of the things that they do that isolate you from the world. You don't need to work. When you go to work, what does that give you? That gives you independence. That allows you to make friendships. When you don't have any of them, who are you calling for help when you're suffering? So in a long story short, very abusive to her, you know, really beat her bad. I remember one time she was pregnant, kicked her in the tummy. She managed to get away the first time around. However, the issue with that is that because the system, let me be polite about it. <laughs> the system is very slow sometimes with helping victims. She had no choice but to come back. And she had to come back again, face the same things, everything and, and in the end she ended up running away we had to get in go to the school let the teachers know dad is not allowed access because the case is in court at the moment the police had to be made aware she basically moved from one town to Birmingham <laughs> which is like three hours on the train away you know all because she had to keep herself safe you know but these things you know like I said isolation she was isolated she didn't have any friends she couldn't have access to the account so she didn't have any money. She didn't have any friends, nothing. She was stuck. So it's almost like a cycle. And again, being an immigrant as well, her English wasn't that great. I, I'm not too sure. I can't remember if she had a passport or not. But again, these are some of the threats that people would be making. If you call the police, you're going to get to them back home. Your kids will be taken away. You don't have a bank account. You know, you don't even have a card. You don't even know how to go and withdraw money. How can you even get a cab to get away? So these are some of the things, manipulation, isolation, gaslighting, you know, coercive control, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional, psychological abuse, all of these, it's not just a, a one thing. There's often all these things under that umbrella that happens. And it's, it's very sad, like I read in the statistics, you know, eight women in a month 
have died. Men die as well. People are dying all the time as a result of this abuse. People are being strangled to death as a result of this. So it's a very serious matter. It's very, very serious. So then I just wanted to briefly touch on some of the reasons why somebody may end up in an abusive relationship. Because sometimes what you hear is, oh, why can't she just leave? <laughs> you know, you hear that all the time. Just pack up your bags and leave when he's sleeping. Why don't you just pack up your bed? It's never that easy. But first, to touch on some of the reasons, some of the reasons why a person may end up in an abusive relationship, sometimes childhood trauma. You know, that trauma from home means they're running out, looking for something else. Sometimes even absent parents and absent father in a person's life could lead them into seeking for love elsewhere. And sometimes it doesn't matter what that love looks like, as long as it wasn't what I had at home or if it wasn't what I didn't get at home. So often at times when perpetrators see that vulnerability in young people or, or people in general, whether that be a man or a woman, they exploit that. You know, other reasons, you know, loss of job. Sometimes a lot of men who are perpetrators, sometimes losses in jobs trigger that because often at times their job is their identity, they're the breadwinner. So when there is no job and they don't have income and maybe the woman is having to be the breadwinner, those roles reversing can be a really big trigger for some people. You know, just life changes, circumstances changes, bereavement, losing loved ones, that can trigger things. Like I said, alcohol, you know, football season, all these things. So, and sometimes people end up in these relationships because that is their norm. You know, if you're growing up in a home or in an environment whereby you're seeing your mom or your dad being beaten up every day, eventually it becomes normal to you. You know, there's a theory by Albert Bandura who done a Bobo doll experiment with children. And essentially he put children in a room and they were exposed to somebody hitting a doll, I think with a stick, I can't quite remember fully. And when they came out, essentially the kids were imitating what they had seen. Children imitate what they see. That's how they learn. They learn based on what they observed through their surroundings. So if a child, if a young person has grown up in an environment when they're seeing that all the time, that is their norm. Yeah, dad may hit mom, but at the end of the day, he provides food. So what's the difference with me being with somebody who hits me, who beats me, who rapes me, who assaults me, as long as there's food on the table? That is their norm. That's what they used to. That is what they know. So sometimes as well, it's that normalized behavior. Um, and like I said, sometimes it people don't go in it knowing it. You know, you don't go into a relationship knowing that it's abusive. Sometimes halfway, it becomes abusive. Like I said, you also maybe a lot of job or or just life circumstances makes it like that. So now going back to that question, why doesn't he or she just leave? Well, they can't leave for various different reasons. A lot of the time there is fear associated when it comes to domestic abuse. There is a lot of threatening I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your family. I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to hurt the kids. <laughs> you know, sometimes she can't just leave because she's fear. She fears for her kids. There is threatening behavior. Again, there was a movie. I can't quite remember the name. Whereby she threatened to leave, and in the end, he killed the kids <laughs> and then killed her and then killed himself after. You know, these things are real. And I'm and I know I'm being very blunt and very brutal with my words, but that is the reality of it. People are being killed every day. You know, people can't leave because of their children. Financial restrictions, they don't have money. They don't have access to a bank account. They may be working 24 seven, but the guy or the girl controls the account. Anything missing, they have to account for every toilet tissue they buy, every toothpaste, every toothbrush. They just can't leave. You know, sometimes they can't leave because the perpetrator actually turns things around and threatens with suicide. If you leave me, I'm gonna kill myself. You know, so there are so many different factors that stops people from leaving. It's not just as easy as packing up your bag and going. Sometimes they track your phone. Sometimes they track your movements without knowing. They stalk you. They follow you. They, they, they would hurt you. And of course, if you were to leave without that safety plan or safety measure in place or without the help of a professional, it could be very fatal for you because you can make them even more angry. So the next time they see you, they're really going to make sure they hurt you. So there are so many different reasons, but one of the main things I really wanted to focus on today is the impact that domestic abuse has on, on, on people or on victims or people who have experienced any type of violence or abuse within a domestic setting. You know, it has an impact on your self-esteem and self-concept, you know, who you are, your identity. 
you're very confused you know it, it has an impact on your relationship with other people trusting other people these are some of the things communicating with other people you become very fearful of people sometimes because you don't know what you're going to get you know it's almost some of the impact is almost as though the impact that you get when you've been traumatized because a lot of this is traumatizing so even last time when I spoke about trauma, I talked about things like hypervigilance. This is where you're constantly on guard. You know, you're constantly looking around because you don't know what's going to happen. If you are at home and you don't know where your next punch is going to come from, you have to be alert, you know, or hypervigilance. This is where you, you almost crown in because you're so fearful. You're so scared. You know, things like flashbacks, you can't sleep, things like isolation, of course, you get the physical bruising, the marks and, and the pain and the burning with the cigarettes and the deodorants. There is so many different impacts that it can have on a person's identity and their self-esteem. But, you know, there is good news in, in knowing that there is help available. You know, the system can be slow sometimes, but there is support available. You know, so if anybody on here has experienced it or if you know somebody who has experienced DV, you know, emergency like I said if it's cases of emergency put in the police you know you've got things like women's aid which is although a national uh, charity there are actually they've broken it up into different localities so wherever you are you can get access to women's aid and they're very very skilled with actually helping you create a safety plan so if you are ready to leave this is how you can do it safely you know things like if you're not ready to leave we still need to put measures in place to help you so things like when you park your car, park it facing outward, make sure it's unlocked, you know, make sure you have a spare key that you can just grab. Things like if you need to get away, make sure you're in a room, but one with windows or a door, don't hide somewhere where you can't access the door. So all these little safety things, you know, the police can fit your house with like um, an alert. They can flag your house. So in cases of emergency, when you call, literally they're, they're to you straight away, there's no delay. So there are so many different things that can be done to support anybody who is going through these things. And, you know, like I said, there's so many different organizations. When I talked about the system being slow, I'm referring it to in terms of moving from a refuge into a home. So often at times when somebody has reported cases of abuse, you can be housed. Um, but like you guys know, there is so shortage of houses and, and all these useful resources and services. So sometimes where you are placed is not close to family. For example, you may be living in London, they may place you in Birmingham because that's where there is space. And you may not know how long you are there for until they find you somewhere appropriate. Sometimes you may be housed in a homeless shelter. And if you've got kids, this may not necessarily be safe, especially if maybe you've got people who drink or take drugs around. So this is what I mean about the system being slow. That's not to say that there isn't services available. If you've got immediate family, the police and other services can work with you are finding a safety plan to stay with somebody who you know and you trust. So there are so many different ways around. It's about communicating your needs and then working along with you to help you figure out what works for you. You know, one of the impacts that I almost forgot to mention is substance and alcohol misuse. A lot of people end up drinking and using drugs and pres prescribed dr drugs and non-prescribed drugs as well as a way of coping as well. So, you know, when it comes to DV, like I said, it affects so many different people. And I found a video, Lisa, I know I messaged you, but I think I might be able to play it from a computer now. Um, and I wanted to show you this video and it's one of a man being abused by his girlfriend. And the reason why I wanted to specifically highlight this video is that, like I said, often at times, the narrative that is pushed is that the man is abusing the woman. And because men don't come out or because they're not very expressive, you may not even know, you know. And I believe this video is so relatable to many of us because it could be your brother. It could be your best friend who is being abused. You know, often at times you see changes in a person's behavior, maybe their personality. Maybe before they met that person, they were very bubbly. They were very fun. They had an opinion about themselves and other people. But as soon as they got into that relationship, you're seeing little changes. They're dressing different. They seem not themselves. They, they can't really express themselves anymore. They're constantly checking the phone. I need to leave. I can't do this. They're not showing up to any events that you invite them in. They just look unkempt. They look tired. So these are some of the signs that we look out for as well in our friendships. Again, especially males as well. Look out for these things as well because 
they do go through these things as well. So I'm just going to quickly play the video if I, if I can figure this <laughs> technical thing out. Okay. Let's see. How am I going to do this? Screen share. Lisa, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you please give me access to be able to screen share this short video? No problem. Yep. Um, oh, okay, perfect. Okay. I think it's this one. There we go, perfect. I hope the, the speaker works. So, can you guys hear it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I start to tell a yeah. story. Yeah. A and uh, when the police found me, I was told I was 10 days old. Which is really caring. She just showed the interest in me. We arrived, she straight away said, oh, there's, there's been a problem, and um, Alex had hurt himself. Top of the stairs, Alex was sat with a towel wrapped around his arm, with blood everywhere. Probably questioned it, they were quite calm and rational and explained that, yeah, you know, Alex had this long-standing history of self-harm. So it's strange because the whole thing was the right time and the right place and didn't say anything. longer they were together and the relationship grew, the mind game started playing. Just a penny drop. Out of the blue. She got his friends to go and pick her up, bring her here. This is how she was saying. I don't mind paying the way, but I was thinking, I can't be with you. I didn't, I didn't hear from her for a year. Next to say, are you willing to meet your grandson? And it was like, yes. I was happy, and I thought, I my son we would be a family. And then I said, I wasn't happy with these mind games starting again. I thought we'd gone past that. I said, we're not having it. So she packed all of TJ's stuff up and she told Alex and she came. Definitely TJ, you don't want to not see him. So I literally just moved out of the house for the last time. Um, Would you say at any point you might be able to see the She got rid of the PlayStation because it was a form of contact. He was only 19 when he went away. change her from doing the stuff she's doing to me, but that lasted. We got a 999 call for a domestic disturbance, two men were called in by neighbours. She had a bread knife on her. She went to go out my head, like here, so I went like that. We arrived and Alex and Jordan were both telling us that he'd used that knife to, to cut his wrists, basically. It didn't appear that there'd been any incident at all between them, it's certainly not how it came across. We left um, Alex in the hospital. We just shouting and arguing. 
the next thing, the door knocks, there's a police car outside, and I open the door, and he was standing there. He said, I'm going to be. Yeah, so that was the first time. In the house, and he was not budging on his door dressing. And I thought, I need to get him out of this environment. Of such a shit. He sat me in the police car and he said, Right, we're not leaving there until you tell me the truth. And I still said, No, I'm, I'm doing this all to myself. Said to the cameras off, it's just you and me in this car. I'm sure everyone had just said it. And I said, just please just go off with what the neighbours have, have said because I don't want to say that he's coming from me. He just quite calmly said to me, it's his hand. How do you feel today about moving forward? Do you have thoughts and fear? I'm just going. Now that I'm free from the relationship, I'm beginning to understand abuse better. As I hope, I can help others understand it too. And I'm building a future for me and my kids. Perfect. Um, yeah, so, you know, I remember first watching that video and, and you know, looking at it and, you know, he, you know, it's, it's a fortunate thing that the officer actually went back because I'm, I'm assuming that obviously he's been trained to find the signs of DV. But if they were to be out as a normal couple, some people wouldn't suspect it. Mm. You know, he may have a bruise on his arm or a little cut here, but if he, even if you, if you listen to what he was talking about and certain things, you know, like she changed my phone, she got rid of the PlayStation because she knew that I can use that to contact people. You know, she isolated, mom said that when he left at 19, hadn't seen him in two years, you know, mind games, these are some of the things and you'd never know, you know, coercive control is so subtle, so fearful, so much so that when the officer was in the house, he still stuck to the story that she had created. It wasn't until she, he got into the car that he basically, and the officer said, I'm not budging, that he was able to come out and say it, you know, so these things are very serious, you know, the neighbors have phoned, I'm sure, they'd phone several times, often at times when, when somebody actually makes a call about DV, when a victim is able to pick up the phone, believe you me, that's not the first time <laughs> the incident has happened. That's their breaking point. They're calling because they know that if I don't do it, I'm going to die. Often at times there's been so many incidents happening before and they've brushed it off, they haven't done it, they were fearful. But the moment they chose to pick up the phone to call is when they were really scared for their lives. But yeah, I wanted to really showcase that video to let you know that men do go through it, you know, and some of these signs, because I know he, he mentioned isolation. Like I said earlier, if you have friends, maybe before they got in relationships or these, this family unit, they were very bubbly, very outgoing. Now, when you see them, they don't look the same. They might have random bruises when you ask them, oh, you know what happened? Oh, I just fell. Just probe a little bit more, you know call in a bit more, check in on them a bit more, take them out of the house if you can, just be there, be that support system. Because sometimes, like I said, if they've been isolated for so long, they don't even have the confidence to say, hey, can you help me? Because they don't even know where to start from. So, you know, just to really round up, because I've been talking for nearly an hour now, I think. <laughs> and, you know, when it comes to domestic abuse, like I said, it happens to anybody. It, it's got nothing to do with your race, your age, your, you know, your background, it can happen to anybody. But I think as people here, one of our roles is to really be supportive, to be that supportive friend or family member, to really be vigilant, to be aware. Don't just take things for face value. You know, if you know any of your siblings are in abusive relationships or if maybe your sibling comes with their new partner, just observe how is he talking to her? How is she talking to him? What is their movements like? Show that you are there to support them because if you can show somebody that you are there they're more likely to pick up the phone and ask for help they're more likely to run to your house when they get to that breaking point that they need to get away at least they know that there is somebody who can who can help me but i think just to round it off as well 
and I didn't really get much time to touch on it, but in the video, we did see that, you know, there is persecution as well. You know, people do get prosecuted, sorry, for, for these acts and these, these harmful behaviors and these violences. So don't feel as though when you report it, it doesn't go anywhere because it does. People do get charged. People do get punished for these behaviors. And, you know, they even get an opportunity to do courses to help them analyze their behavior, to help them change these behaviors around. And as a victim or somebody who has experienced it as well, you can also get help to rebuild your self-esteem, your confidence. And like I said, there's things like women's aid, there are trained workers. You get allocated your own worker who will basically guide you through the process, help you get your life back, help you get your confidence back as well. So, you know, you don't have to suffer in silence. Do not suffer in silence. And I always say this, you know, every time I get a chance to speak, you know, I know that within a lot of BAME communities, not speaking about family issues is a thing. When it became a thing, me, I don't even know. You know, don't speak about it. What happens in the family stays at the family, not at the expense of your life. I'm really sorry, but I don't agree with that. If you're being hurt, if you're in an abusive relationship, if you are facing trauma, you need to get help. You need to go to somebody who can help you because like I said, the long-term impact is, is very huge. It can really have a detrimental you know, impact on your life. And most of all, you can, you can end up losing your life as a result of it. So, you know, you don't have to suffer in silence. Just get help. Just that's really what I want to leave you with really. Just get help. There are so many services you can call the National Domestic Helpline, you know, Women's Aid and so many different things that you can do. So, yeah. That's my <laughs> very long presentation. But thank you guys so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Pamela. Wow, wow, wow. That was so, so good. Um, wow, I don't even know what to add. But um, can you send me like a resource of information that you may have in this area? And then I'll send it out to people so that they've got something that they can work with.